don't, don't fall in, don't, don't, don't. Ooh. How's it going, everybody? So I had like a five minute intro for this that I just cut out. Now, I changed gears halfway through this from trying to think, well, let's just do a wham, bam, thank you, man, like really mercilessly cut down version and get you the facts for this. But then I thought I spent a lot of time on this, like 20, 30 hours of video or something like that. And you're going to see why it took like three weeks to get this, this uh, second part of this series out. But I decided since I had this and I was going to do a bunch of evaluation, I might as well show you everything and just cut out the ums and the uhs and, you know, me fiddling around with stuff. So this is going to be recorded and narrated in one big long chunk Then I'm going to slice it up and upload them all to YouTube on the same day and then cue them to upload, you know, a couple days apart or whatever. So I'll try to quasi-systematically examine the manufacturer claims and the selling points, then we'll look at the print quality, and then we'll look at, you know, miscellaneous issues to come up along the way. And then after that, we'll do a video with some mods to try to see how we can address these in either a free or a low-cost way. And then when all is said and done, just like put the pedal to the metal, try to do some like challenging prints and see how it works out. And it may sound like in the course of this that I'm beating up the printer. He, here's the thing. We're act, we're going through and we're purposely looking for problems. So it's going to sound very negative. Don't worry. It's not necessarily negative. We just have to find these problems and then see if they are actually an issue that can be addressed or not. If you're new to these videos, I always use timestamps in the video index. I'm pretty good about that because there's going to be things you're not interested in and things you might want to rewatch several times. So make liberal use of that. There's also going to be theory that you may or may not be interested in and newbie content that I have to put in there for beginners that may not apply to you. So, yeah. And I'm going to repeatedly mention that, oh, in the future, I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. So go ahead and like and subscribe and all that. I have to say it. I have to say it. So I started off with selling point number one, which is the removable magnetic print surface. So basically there are a few different types of magnets. Commonly, the, the ones you see the most are like ceramic magnets, you know, i.e. ferrite magnets, uh, alnico magnets, aluminum nickel cobalt magnets, and then neodymium magnets, like rare earth magnets. It might also be like samarium cobalt. There's a whole bunch of different types. But neodymium magnets, they're very strong, used for a whole bunch of things these days, but they don't tend to be able to take heat very well. There's a point with a magnet, it's called the Curie temperature, where you've altered the properties of the material and you lose the magnetism. Sometimes it's permanently damaged, sometimes you just have to remagnetize, it depends on the material. But at a very low Curie point, there are high temperature neodymium magnets these days, and you can see that used in like the um, the Prusa, I think the Mark III bed uses embedded high temp neodymium magnets. But when you're talking about magnetic sheets, basically it's like a refrigerator magnet, right? So lines of alternating magnetism that makes for, they try to maximize the hold while minimizing the required gauss. But you have two, two things there. One, the magnets themselves, the, material, the magnetized material, it may or may not have a low or high Curie point. And second is the binder, the matrix that holds the whole thing together. Fridge magnets are, most of them are vinyl. And vinyl, once you hit like boiling temperature, it just pfft, melts to slag. I think it starts softening at like 85C, don't quote me on that. But then at 100C, it just, pfft, you know, melts. So obviously that's not good. And obviously we don't some, want something with a, a low melting or a low Curie temperature because then as soon as you heat up your bed, the magnets are dead. So I cooked the bed at max temperature and I'm delighted to say that it is still magnetic. So that's good. It also didn't deform. That's also good. In terms of warm up time to the 110 degrees that you would typically use for ABS, for example, it took between five and five and a half minutes to do. That's not too bad. And in terms of leveling the bed, there is a guided procedure in the menu right here. So you could do all of the corners and the center. And all it really does is move the head and then you do the old paper leveling with the knobs on the bottom of the bed. A little archaic, but it tends to work. Now, in most modern firmwares, you can do mesh bed leveling where it 
uh, extrapolates the topology based on certain um, data points with or without a bed probe. So if you're doing that with a probe, it's called automatic bed leveling. Without, it's manual mesh leveling. So we're not doing mesh leveling right here, obviously. You would likely need at least nine bed points for that. Maybe that's something we could change with a firmware fix. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, at the moment, it's just regular old guided standard bed leveling. And before you print, before every print, actually, go ahead and wipe the bed down with something like isopropyl alcohol, some kind of solvent to make sure you don't have any finger grease on there. So now let's go ahead and do a sample print off the SD card. I'm just going to use the included black PLA. A black doesn't show up great on camera, but it's what we're going to use right now. We'll switch to other stuff later. And I just picked a random model on here. It would be nice if the included prints had, you know, like calibration tests and things like that, but they had just some sort of guardian. So I was like, all right, fine, I'll print a guardian and see how it works out. And the first layer went down just fine, which is great. But the problem I immediately noticed it is freaking loud. These fans are really, really loud. So we have two tiny 30 millimeter fans that run at extremely high RPM. They seem to put out a good volume of air, but man, they are just cranking loud. But I didn't have a ton of time to ponder how noisy the fans were because we ran into our first problem pretty quickly, and that was a layer shift. Now, layer shifts can happen for any one of dozens of different reasons. I figured I would let it go and see what happened. It seemed to correct itself and then get worse and worse and worse until we had this rather bizarre avant-garde print. And I, I'm not even mad. This is pretty awesome. But awesome is not good. And obviously we have a problem we have to fix here. And since the shifts were happening only on the x-axis, that means either there was a problem exclusively with the x-axis or it was exacerbated by something like the tool head being so heavy, which it is. It's a really heavy tool head. So I stopped the avant-garde cubist interpretation of a figurine, checked to make sure all the axes were moving properly, and they were. So it ends up that the issue I was having was I had set the printer on top of the instruction manual and a few other things were around it, and that was blocking the airflow. So bear in mind, these stepper drivers appear to be very sensitive to the airflow. I was just overheating them, and we were getting layer shifts. Because if you recall from the assembly video, our board is mounted upside down, which is not the best for uh, convection cooling. So definitely 100% dependent on forced air cooling. Problem solved, or so I thought. The next print I tried was perfectly cool, and I still got shifts almost immediately, like after the first five or six layers. So yeah, we had something else going on in addition to our thermal issues. So my next thought was either crosstalk, interference, or bad connection. So to combat that, I snapped some ferroids onto the lines. I also unbundled them and gave them a little bit of separation in case there was inductive coupling going on with crosstalk. Ultimately, I discovered that the problem was that the JST connectors just sit in there kind of loose and it was making intermittent contact. So yeah, just be aware of that. that that's potentially dangerous because you could blow out your stepper drivers if you have an intermittent connection. But if you keep those nice and rigid, it should be fine, and that fixed the problems that I had with this particular print. But after I got the figurine printed out, it looked pretty decent. Now, you can see that obviously we have some kind of problems with either consistency or extrusion or layer heights, you know, that type of thing. Pro some problem with the Z-axis. We'll have to do some investigation, see what's going on. But other than that, it was pretty decent. So to diagnose a problem, I just whipped up a Z-test. It was basically just a rectangle with two adjacent corners rounded off a little bit and a pretty low print speed, just so we don't run into those random extrusion issues and we can see if there's any other mechanical issues that are going on. That'll let you see not only something like Z-axis wobble, but banding from over extrusion and any cyclical trends or random trends and let you diagnose the problem a little bit better. Now, it looked to me like there wasn't a definite Z wobble problem. It was a Z inconsistency problem, as well as some extrusion problems that will be, that will randomly kind of show up. So I just did the ball bearing trick. Why not? See if it fixes the problems. You can go back and check my video on the ball bearing trick if you want to see what that is. Pretty simple thing. Cost is one ball bearing. And while we were at it, I figured I would lubricate the lead screw as well because it was pretty dry. I just used SAE 20 uh, three in one oil. That seemed to work fine. Make sure you're not dripping it all over everything. Lubed the nut a little bit, lubed it up and down the shaft, cleaned it off. And that was pretty much it. I mean, you could basically use any synthetic oil. You can use a Teflon impregnated synthetic oil. You want various different types of grease. It, it doesn't really matter. I just decided to use machine oil since it was the first thing I grabbed. Just don't use anything super thin like WD-40 or liquid wrench. 
So with no other changes, just with the ball bearing trick and the lubrication, I got a second sample printed out that we can compare to the first one. I'll kind of shine these in a light so you can see what's going on. This bottom sample is the first one and you can see the cyclical problems going on, whereas the top one is the second one after those two mods and you can see how much more even it is. Obviously it's not perfect and with this test we did give it its just best chance to succeed so we'll look more into that in a little bit further down the video. That was a relatively simple fix. Let's move on to something a little bit more involved which is the parts cooling fan. So cooling. This is a pretty old type of a system they have here. It's just a single axial fan, small guy, 30 millimeters, into a triangular funnel that's bolted onto the front. The good thing is that the stock mount only has two screws that are very easy to get to, so you could bolt on any cooling solution you want. The bad thing is, in order to get through the static pressure of that funnel, if you're going to be using an axial fan, you're going to have to ramp up the RPMs a lot, which means it's really loud. So is it effective? Well, I'll show you in a minute how effective or not effective it is, but regardless, it's super loud. So when you're talking about necessary cooling performance and then you're talking necessary cooling performance normalized against the noise level, that, that's a different conversation completely. Now, I tried to slice a model with very fast movement speeds, very fast, very high extrusion rates, very fast acceleration and jerk times, but I found that the firmware was limiting it to a certain degree. But I also discovered that the speed multiplier on the screen appeared to override that to a certain degree. I also discovered that the motion of the 3D printer lagged a little bit when I was messing around with the UI settings. So that means it could get a little bit herky jerky. Be careful with changing settings on the fly, in other words, because you could get blobby sections as you can see here. But I was able to ramp it up to where I was outrunning the cooling and then we can get an idea of what's going on. Using a highly scientific calibrated chopping bag test, I was able to see that we do actually have a fair bit of air coming out of this fan. Unfortunately, it's only on one side. As expected, one side's pretty good. That's where the fan's blowing. The other side is pretty much a disaster. And, you know, whatever, that's, that's to be expected. There's no fan on that side. How would you have any cooling on that side? Measuring the sound pressure levels from one foot away, dear Lord, is this loud. At a meter away where I'm sitting, it's not terrible. Still not something I want blaring in my ear all day long, though. In the future, whenever I get time to do this, I'm gonna have to do a proper video on sound pressure levels, how the decibel scale works and all that, because it's counterintuitive and there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation, because it's a confusing system. It's not, it's not intuitive at all. But basically all you need to know here is higher equals louder. The amount of latitude depends. Also, sound pressure level depends on when you're talking about you know, multiple sources versus single source. If their um, spectrum is the same or if their spectrum is dissimilar, how close they are to the source and that sort of deal. Like I said, it gets complicated. We'll deal with that later. But yeah, two aspects, which is more loud, which has a higher amplitude on our scale and the frequency spectrum, basically. Now the human ear, if you look at like the uh, Fletcher Munson curves, which aren't exact, but they're close enough. We have a peak sensitivity around like 2000 to 3000 Hertz. That's where we can hear things the best. And that's where things also tend to be the most annoying. Also up toward like 4,500 to like 6,500 is super annoying. So in this picture, our original fan system is the green line on the top. That's a single 30 millimeter fan. On the bottom, we have our Herp Derp system, which is two of these 4010 cooling fans. If you're interested, those are the, the turbo ball bearing models. But the area we're interested in is where they start to diverge around like 600 hertz or so. And then around our high sensitivity area, we have about 18 decibels worth of difference in sound pressure level between the two systems. And generally speaking, that is several times louder. But that's getting off topic. We are not yet finished with our preliminary evaluation of the print quality. So let's talk about surface quality. For this test, I just made a model that spanned a large area of the sheet and I wanted to see how the lines laid down to each other with and without damping the hot end. So as you can see right here in the upper left hand corner, this is where I just lay my fingers on there to damp some of the vibration that's going to the tool head. 
and the results they kind of speak for themselves. You can see obviously that that section is printing a lot smoother and shinier than the sections where I wasn't putting my finger on there to stop it from vibrating. Now, if you remember all the way back to when I was doing the initial Ender videos, you recall that my hot end radiator cooling fan had a blade that was snapped off, and so it was very uneven and producing that sort of pattern. I put the filament under a microscope, my, my, my microscope and showed that. Now, that sort of a thing, that can translate, those vibration can translate into prints a couple different ways, one being the fans and that sort of deal. So whether or not that vibration translates into your prints is directly related to how much one part moves in relation to the other. So if the whole machine's moving, vibrating together, who cares? It doesn't matter. Relative to the bed or the X, Y axis, when you're talking about the extruder, if your extruder's jittering around, that's obviously gonna cause that effect. So this is a problem that I ran into with the, uh, the live stream printer where I used the $8 budget, like, you know, from overseas linear rail. It didn't have enough preload on the bearings to prevent that little type of a vibration. If you look at something that has a, um, you know, cantilevered, uh, single, like self, self supporting mechanism for the, um, the carriage, like the E3D tool changer. If you look at their specs, you'll see that they have different preload spec for the different axes. And the way that you preload these linear carts is by changing the clearance. So if you want a negative clearance, you need oversized ball bearings to do that. Now finding the very slight gradations of bearing sizes that you need is not very easy. And the only way that I could find them for a relatively reasonable price was to order them from South Korea for some reason. But this shipment's not going to get here until next year, quite unfortunately. So I couldn't do that for this video. But since I use linear guideway for other things than 3D printing, I do have lots of replacement bearings for them. The X felt pretty smooth as opposed to the Y, which felt like a freaking disaster, as I mentioned in the first video. But it's a lot easier to take off. So we could at least use that to see if there's any schmutz and metal filings and that type of stuff in there. I did a video already where I took apart these uh, linear carts, so you can go check that out if you want. I won't bore you with the details again, but just generally, unbolt these. I took some uh, WD-40 in a compressed can with a spray nozzle and I hosed everything out into this little piece of Tupperware here to see if I can get any sludge and detritus to wash out of there. Then I just use this neodymium magnet like I showed you in the other video to check and see if any filings are attracted to it in the sludge that washed out of the cart. This did have some, it, it didn't look like little filings. It actually looked like steel wool. So that's unlikely to be a part of the cart or the bearings themselves and probably just a byproduct of the finishing process. Maybe they use some kind of like steel fiber to polish these races. Um, I can't be positive, but that's just what it looked like. The general quality of the surface of the races wasn't terrific, but it seems to be a little bit better at least than the ones that I had a, a year or two ago, whenever it was that I did that video. And if you're interested, I decided to repack these with Super Lube multi-purpose grease. It's uh, NLGI Class 2, just like High One recommends for their rails. Not quite as crucial on these cheapies, but, you know, might as well stick close to that. Okay, back to the manufacturer claims checklist. Theoretically, this should be able to print TPU flexible filament, so time to bust out the Ninja Flex. First thing I noticed was, ah, oh, the filament path is a little bit goofy here. It was hard to get it in there. You can do it, but it, as you can see, it takes a little fiddling because there's not quite the alignment that you would like. But after I got that fed in, it seemed to be able to feed the filament just fine without it bulging out and jamming. And I even got the first print to work fairly well with minimal tuning to the profile. Now, the biggest problem that I had was stringing because I only had the cooling on the one side. I didn't really mess around with the retraction and the acceleration settings too much, but that's something a bit tuned out. I did, however, get a jam when I went to switch back to PLA filament. What happened was it melted. You know how it melted gets a little plug shape? Well, the very end of this heat break throat is a little bit narrower than the two millimeter interior of the uh, PTFE sleeving, so I couldn't quite get it out, which was super annoying, and I had to drill it out of there. Also, to unjam this extruder, you have to take the whole freaking thing apart like this, take the entire feeder off of there. It, it's really annoying. It, it could be worse, but it, it could be a lot better. 